hunter-gatherer societies, you share with a lot of people, you go through your ups and downs, they help you, you help them. There's a real feeling of closeness, okay? You come to a market society and it's much more productive, okay? So the absolute level of welfare goes way up, but it creates this, this deep insecurity. Do these people really care about me or not? My name is John Tooby. I'm a co-director of the Center for Evolutionary Psychology at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, with my wife and lifelong collaborator, Lita Cosmides. When I was uh, uh, a freshman majoring in physics, I had been thinking a lot about evolutionary applications and making sense of the world in that way. And I thought, well, I'll go check out what they're doing in psychology. And to my astonishment, then, which is 1970, and it's, I'm still astonished 40 years later, uh, although there's been some changes, there was almost no use of the really powerful idea that uh, the only force that organizes any biological system uh, functionally is natural selection. I thought, well, I know as much as they do because they don't know anything. Right before my sophomore year, I discovered um, that there was a whole field of evolution and behavior evolutionary biologists applying their theories to understanding animal behavior. And I got very excited because it promised to not just say how it is that animals do what they do, but why they do what they do and why humans do what they do. What we thought was, that was missing from the early um, approaches to sociobiology was this level of description of well, what's the, the architecture of the human mind? What are the programs that we all have by virtue of being human beings? And so a lot of our early careers we spent trying to figure out, well, what do we mean by that and how do you study it and, and so forth. And so uh, we spent a lot of years thinking about that and working with colleagues on what are the foundations of evolutionary psychology. Initially, people were horrified at the idea of applying evolutionary thinking to the human mind. The first paper I ever wrote, uh, much to my surprise, took many years to get into a journal, not because the results were uninteresting, but because the journals were horrified at the idea that the hypotheses were derived from an evolutionary theory. If I had had the same hypothesis, but I'd been playing pinball, and it just come to me as a hypothesis, that would have been okay. But the idea that, as I always thought scientists were supposed to, that you had a, a larger theory from which you derived testable hypotheses, and then you tested them, that was what was objectionable when, you know, back in 1985. Max Planck talked about science progressing funeral by funeral, whereas it's not that People who had one set of opinions get convinced and change their minds, like the ideals. Ah, sometimes it. they do. Although it's rare and interesting and highly valued, uh, but uh, but much more commonly, uh, the younger people who don't have a stake are the people who adopt it, and they grow up with the new way of thinking, and that's that's really happening. Evolutionary psychology is an approach to understanding the human mind in which you really take. Um, seriously the idea that our minds were shaped by natural selection and that they were designed to operate in an ancestral environment of, of hunter-gatherer life. Um, it's, a, it's a vanished way of life now but where we lived in small social groups of you know maybe 50 to 200 people um, many of whom were close kin um, and uh, and the idea is that we're trying to understand what are the reliably developing species typical programs um, that are that constitute human nature. We have a friend and uh, mentor, Roger Shepard, who's uh, one of the founders of cognitive science, and he uh, said that uh, perception is externally driven hallucination. All sorts of things that we think are matters of the external world are in fact, uh, you know, these matrix programs playing in our heads and structuring the world for us. And there really is, of course, an external world and that corresponds sometimes to some of these elements, but, but we're lost in this video game that we mistake for reality. Our experience of the visual world is is highly constructed by programs that we have no conscious access to. That's common, you, you'll learn that in any cognitive psychology course. Um, where evolutionary psychology differs is in the notion that we have, first of all, that you have many programs in your head, not just one big learning mechanism, but many different, many different learning mechanisms designed for learning about different aspects of the world. And, um, and, and that they, they structure even our social intuitions and our moral intuitions and our intuitions about how to behave with, how to cooperate and how to behave with other people. Um, that flies in the face of the main approach to the human mind for most of the last century, which is a 
standard social science model, the, mo the model that we have a blank slate mind and that all content in our heads comes from uh, experience from the world. This sort of new view with, you know, the human mind is full of active programs, sifting information, spontaneously interacting. Um, making decisions. Making decisions. Making inferences about what's true. Finding ways to be individual and to discover ways of being valuable to others in indi highly individual ways. It's a much more interesting and dynamic uh, sort of 21st century view of what it is to be a human. If you're a hunter-gatherer, it's really hard to get too much fat. Um, game animals are really lean, they're hard to get, they run away from you, and if you don't have a taste for uh, fats, uh, you're not going to go to all the trouble to be hunting. Um, uh, sugar is the same way, you're going to get f sugar from, from fruits mostly, fruit and sometimes honey, and you just can't get too much of it as a hunter-gatherer. Now fast forward to the modern world, we have a market economy that produces immense amounts of, of, of food from all parts of the world. Um, we have access to, to um, well-fed um, animals that are marbled with fat. Um, we have access to uh, all kinds of sugars and ice creams and so forth. There's a mismatch between ancestral conditions in the modern environment. And so a taste for fats and sugars that was very, um, that's a result of adaptations that were reproduction promoting in the past is now causing problems for us in the present. I think our hunter-gatherer ancestry plays a role in how profoundly we misunderstand the economic world. We're not designed to understand invisible hand processes at all. If somebody says, I'll do this for you, but only if you do that for me, that's a sign of social distance for humans uh, and an explicit exchange, okay? You, with your friends, that you say, well, of course I'll do it. You know, if you, they invited you over for dinner at the end, you got up and you offered to pay them, that would be weird and that would also be a sign that you didn't really feel close to them. Explicit exchange is a sign of social distance. That's what you do with people that you don't know very well. So think about now in a market economy. Every time I go to Starbucks and get a mocha, I'm engaging in explicit exchange. Every time I do most things that I do in a market economy, they're explicit exchange. Every time I do that, I'm getting a, a signal of social distance that these are not people who care about my welfare, that they, I am not uniquely valued. The fact that the natural world is by and large a zero-sum world permeates our thinking. So when we see wealth, we think of it, it was taken away from somebody else and not created where there was no wealth before, okay? So it's, it's very interesting to me that, you know, we now live in a world which is amazingly wealthy in industrialized societies and people have no appreciation about uh, how intricate and how labor intensive and how uh, uh, unlikely a set of arrangements those are. Redistribution of societies that by and large remain poor and societies which uh, allow people who don't have something to create something create new wealth that didn't exist before and so we've gone from a world in which you know 99.99% .99 of people are poor to a world in which, depending on your definition, you know, a few percent in the West are poor. Sometimes you have natural experiments like the Berlin Wall, where you have West Berlin and East Berlin. Huge difference etched in stone between two philosophies, two social philosophies. Um, that really was a, uh, that was a real experiment. The idea of socialism is hearkening back to this sharing level of people who care about you. But then it's, it's uh, delivery in a mass society is the, the people making the decisions don't know about you, don't care about you. And in fact, the, what they're only, the only thing they're supposed to view uh, as important is what good are you to the social system? And so that has its... That, that's uh, why it always sounds nice prospectively, but turns into a hell on earth when it's actually implemented. It's a problem that so many Historians people... Historians will write about all sorts of things without thinking it's necessary to understand economics, and they make all sorts of conclusions about economics without... People will think it's okay to run for public office without having ever taken any economics, without having any clue about how markets work. It's... Amazing. It's shocking. It, it, I, I'm not kidding. It's, it, it's shocking.